Hi students, today we will discuss about the principle of double effect. Now when, when we talk about the principle of double effect, it is, it pertains to, it is a principle that pertains to almost all medical procedures that have many implications when performed to your, to your patients. Now this principle is primarily used when a particular procedure will engender not only beneficial effects but also calculated or foreseen harmful effects. Now, for us to arrive at an ethical decision, we must establish a judgment you know, over an action that is ethically legitimate even if it is followed by an evil effect. Now, there are four major uh, tenets for the principle of double effect, which are, which we, which we need to fulfill all of them uh, to say that an action with intertwined evil effect will have um, will be will be will be an ethical course of action. Now, remember that these four tenets should be met. It's like a yes or no proposition. When not all principles or tenets are met, then we can say that an action is unethical. But or the tenets are met properly or, or the conditions of it are met properly, then it is an ethical action. Now, the first uh, action would be for an action to be ethically legitimate or justified. The first principle or condition that needs to be uh, fulfilled is that, number one, the action, in its object, in its form, should be ethically good or at least indifferent. When we say indifferent, these actions are those who are not good, but not bad, okay? The criteria to be considered an act for an action to be good is that it is directed toward the right ultimate end. Ibig sabihin, dapat ma-meet no? yung uh, pinaka-objective, which is the right ultimate or end. Number two, there should be an effective means to achieve that goal. And that number two, uh, the intention should be honest. Second principle or condition of double effect uh, goes like this, or pertains to your intention. Okay? The agency intention to achieve directly the beneficial effect, and even if there is a harmful effect. In Latin, this is uh, what you call your primus in intentione. Okay? So your primary intention should always be to achieve the good out of the action and not the bad or the resulting harm if harmful effect. Okay? The unforeseen harmful effect, although it is necessary, should not be the direct intention sought, but only as a side effect of an action. Take note. The harmful effect should always be considered as a side effect before you can say that this condition of the principle of double effect is met. No? If what which is directly is wrong, then the action definitely will be wrong. The third condition of the principle of double effect is pertains to the amount, no? Amount of beneficial effect, okay? should be, be equal to or greater than the amount of foreseen harmful effect. Okay? So this condition requires you to look at the amount of beneficial effect. For an action to be acceptable, to be ethically acceptable, the beneficial effect should be greater than the harmful effect. Okay? The beneficial effect of an act must be greater Okay, in value or at least equal to the harmful effect. And that there should be, uh, if there is an imbalance that is present, the good should overcome the bad. Or at least the equal to. Alright? The fourth condition is what you call, uh, per pertains to the time when the, when the beneficial effect come into place or play. No? The beneficial effect must happen first or at least at the same time as the harmful effect. This requisite is necessary requirement under the element for the order of time. 
the good effect should never be a result of the bad effect because if evil happens first, it would it would connote or it can, it can be understood that the harmful effect is your prime intention. No? So it's like uh, it's it's connected to the second condition of double effect. No? It's connected to that. So, so you have to examine whether the harmful effect comes after the good effect. All right? Here are some of the best examples where we can see the, uh, the, the application of the principle of double effect. No? In the use of your, of your chemotherapy, we all know that there are several side effects. No? There can be alopecia, there can be immunocompromise, uh, uh, mag magiging immunocompromised ka, your, your, uh, your red blood cells would fall, no? there can be stomach ache, nausea, and you're prone to infection. But despite of the many side effects of that, uh, of that treatment, okay, there's still good in it. And what good is that? Is to be cured of cancer. There's a possible chance to cure cancer. So if we will apply the four principles of double effect, we can say that number one, the intention is, uh, the action is to cure. That in itself, no, the action of curing is actually a good action. Okay? So the first condition is met. How about the second condition? The second condition says, says to us that our prime intention should be good. And what is the intention of the when we administer or when we administer our chemotherapeutic agents? We try to cure the patient of its cure of, of his or her cure uh, illness. In that way, our prime intention is to help the patient. Third, the third condition says that beneficial effect should be greater than the harmful effect. Sabi nga natin, there's more, uh, it seems like more effects, which are your side effects, no? When you apply, no? When you apply your chemotherapeutic agents. But then, no? The fact that you are being cured of cancer is far even more greater than all of these side effects. So the third condition would allow you to continue with your chemotherapy and lastly and lastly the order of appearance of harmful and beneficial effects when you administer chemotherapy the beneficial effect will always come first because when it enters your bloodstream it will start killing your cancer cells while harmful effects like your side effects will only come after some uh, uh, right up uh, come after some cycles of your chemotherapy. So, what can we say about the use of uh, chemotherapy in terms of the principle of double effect? Chemotherapy can be done or is ethically acceptable. Do you understand? Now, let's go to another principle in bioethics, which is your principle of legitimate cooperation. Now, when you say legitimate cooperation, this is uh, the type of cooperation to an evil act so that you would prevent a greater evil to happen. It's not actually identifying yourself to the evil act, but rather you are connected to that particular evil act, but you want to uh, you are participated in that because you want to avoid a greater evil. Okay? But one uh, this is a good reflection point for what it is to be legitimately cooperating. But one may sometimes judge it to be an ethical duty to cooperate materially with an immoral act that is only indirectly intended to its harmful effect when only in this way can greater harm be prevented. Now, provided that cooperation is not immediate, and that the, the degree of cooperation and the danger of the scandal are taken into account. Okay? 
So in the principle of legitimate cooperation, there are two forms of cooperation. One is legitimate, which is not directly identifying yourself to the evil act. And the other one is the one that that directly identifies you to the evil act, which is formal cooperation. Okay? So you are identified uh, with the purpose of an objectively evil act. Now, the one who cooperates has a direct intention for the evil evil object. Has direct intention for the for the evil object itself. Now, you have to remember that formal cooperation can take no, in these following forms. You can be identified directly to the evil act by doing the bad action itself. Number two, you agree with that action. Number three, you counsel for that action, meaning binigyan mo siya ng, uh, ng payo. It's like advising. No? Promoting the evil act. Provoking a person no, to do an evil act and to condone the evil act itself. When we say don't, maliit mo yung action, yung evil act. As if it's nothing. No? So if you condone an evil act, you, you tend to, you are actually formally cooperating no? into that evil act. Okay? So what are the, what are the samples? No? For example, in a bank robbery, Okay. In the bank robbery, you ask your friends no, that you want to, buy, to rob a bank and then some of your friends no, advise that they should go for it, no, promoted that evil act. And even uh, yung sa Pilipino kung tawagin ay eh, ipinagkibalikat, no? inayaan na lang. Okay? Pero alam niya na meron ka siyang Merong evil na mangyayari, which is the bank robbery. So those people that I've mentioned, they are formally cooperating with the act. Even though you did not no, participate in the action, but if you do not speak up, if you do not say something about the wrongdoing, you are actually doing or formally cooperating with the evil action. But if, for example, the bank robbers no, threatened you if you did not join their cause, no? But then but it forced you to join them. No, are you formally cooperating with them? No. By the principle of legitimate cooperation, if you cooperated with them because there's a threat that you want to to prevent, no, a greater threat, no, to prevent, then you are legitimately cooperating with that evil act. Because you just want to prevent a greater evil to happen. No, which is the death of your family or whatever evil actions greater than bank robbery na magagawa pa ng mga magnanakaw. Okay? Now, so this one is the second type of cooperation, which is your material cooperation, which is the legitimate kind of cooperation. Okay? So when we say material cooperation, yun nga, uh, binabanggit natin doon na hindi siya directly identified with the action, but it is uh, you're just um, you're just participating, no? Because you want to prevent a greater evil to happen. Okay. And the last principle that we will uh, discuss is what you call the principle of autonomy of your patients. Now, when we talk of autonomy, this comes from the two Greek words mean uh, from the two Greek words auto, which means self, and nomos law. Okay. Now, if you combine them, this mean this this literally means self-governance okay so the principle of autonomy says that people have their have their own right to rule for themselves no they have the right to self-determination okay an attribute of a person to possess the exercise no freedom of their choice and action in the pursuit of individual goals whether in the present or in the future now this is important in healthcare because the patient is the most important person in the healthcare setting because all uh, because all decisions should come from him no or her okay and must be respected as they relate to the ex exercise of his freedom and is an essential part of his personhood dahil ang autonomy ay ang ang expression ng sarili dapat galangin ito 
ito ay expression ng pagiging tao ng isang tao. No? So this is an expression of personhood. So we must respect it. Okay? The concept of autonomy sometimes has been understood in an extreme way. Okay? By by saying that as having the right to whatever wish, no? They do to their bodies, to your own bodies, as long as no one else is harmed. No? Because we have to be careful with, uh, with you know, such notion of autonomy because the exercise of genuine autonomy is always through the achievement of what is intrinsically good. Pag sinabing intrinsically good, intrins universally good for everyone. No? Not just good for the relative self. No? Hindi pa pwede na good sa akin pero bad sa iba. No? So you have to respect me because this is what is good for me. No. We have to respect an autonomy which is directed towards the universally accepted good. For example, no, if your patient wants to commit suicide, will you respect it? Okay? Because if you will respect, no, in a way it if you respect this autonomy in a way na dahil gusto niya 'yon, then you are wrong. Because the exercise of autonomy should always be the promotion of what is good. No? Saving a person's life. Kaya nga yan nagpagamot sa ospital para gamutin mo. Hindi, hindi, hindi tanggapin na siya ay magpakamatay. So whatever happens to your patient, no? whatever the patient should ever decide, you should always examine whether it is towards a universal good. Okay? So therefore, if that's the case, patient autonomy is never absolute. No? And if it's never absolute, always remember then that the decisions made by health professionals are also never absolute. Kasi minsan kapag uh, we, we, we disrespect or we, we, there's a tendency that healthcare professionals would, would have a paternalistic tone. No? What do we mean when we say paternalistic tone? Masyad, uh, ang point of view ng healthcare ay sa point of view lamang ng mga health professionals. Kung ano ang sinabi ng doktor, yun ang susundin. Kung ano ang sinabi ng nurse, yun ang susundin. Okay? So therefore, our our attitude no of uh, of paternalism should never be imposed on our patients. Because we have to respect their autonomy. Okay? Now, paternalism can be overcome by establishing an evidence-based practice paradigm. By going to an evidence-based practice paradigm. Or a paradigm that is in, in nursing practice na naka, nakaugat, no? nakaugat sa nursing research or sa healthcare research. So your action should always be based on what is found in the studies, no? what is found in science, okay? so that our patients will be enlightened. And when they are enlightened, they can make no, good decisions, they can make better decisions for themselves. Okay? So here are some of the requirements for autonomy of your patients. No? Number one, there should be a moral contract between you and your patient. When we say moral contract, a, a relationship, no? that is based on trust. Number two, there should be a promise to treat your patient according to your best judgment. Okay? When we say best judgment according to our expertise or capacity as health provider, and number two, according to the capab capability of the health facility. Kasi baka mamaya, we keep on saying na kaya kitang gamutin, pero hindi naman, hindi naman pala kayang i-accommodate yung procedure niya sa hospital na yun. Okay? So that's false autonomy, no? Or false informed consent sa inyong pasyente. Okay? Number three, the requirement. The doctor should be, uh, although he believes he knows best, should fully inform your patient. No? Hindi lang doctor, bilang kayo rin, bilang mga nurses. Although you believe, no? You know, you know better than your patient, you should fully inform that your patient, no? and defer to the latter's 
opinion or option to accept or reject the proposed plan of management. No? Dapat, kung ano ang gusto ng pasyente, no? if it is universally good, you have to respect it. Okay? So for a patient to be uh, to be informed, no? To have an informed consent, okay? Yung kanyang kakayahan na magbigay ng pahintulot, no? Because uh, siya ay na-inform, eh dapat mabigyan siya ng information on these four aspects, no? Yung kanyang diagnosis, dapat alam niya. Number two, therapeutic management, kung ano yung dapat na mga gawin para mapagaling siya. Number three, prognosis no ko ano yung magiging kahihinatnan niya after the treatment siya ba ay gagaling siya ba ay lalala siya ba ay kung ano man okay and the financial implications of your treatment next is when the patient is competent you should seek proxy consent no when we say proxy consent you get the consent from other person authorized to give no permission about the patient's treatment Okay, it can be in the form of durable power of attorney. Pag sinabing durable power of attorney, merong attorney at uh, attorney, uh, attorney, no? May abogado yung pasyente para magbigay ng uh, pahintulot sa iyo gawin upang gawin ng kanyang treatment, no? Number two, there should be an advance there. It can be in the form of advance directive, no? Advance directive, ibig sabihin, bago pa man siya nagkaroon ng malalang sakit or hindi na kakayahan or dumating sa estado na hindi siya makapag-decide no yun yung mga ano niya yun yung mga da, yun yung mga dokumento na dapat mong sundin no yung mga bin, binigay niyang uh, habilin no bago siya magkasakit no kung ano yung dapat gawin sa kanya etc or even familial relations okay so if you're getting a consent no from a a from a patient na babae or lalaki na may asawa kapag siya ay hindi makapagbigay ng consent you should seek the spouses no spouses consent kung walang spouse at hindi rin available you seek the consent of the parents no of the parents kung wala nang parents no at kung may anak naman yung anak okay so you have to exhaust no all the uh, familiar relations before you decide on your own okay meron pa meron pa rin tayong uh, meron din tayong kinukuha ng consent sa mga uh, sa mga sa mga sa mga kaibigan no sa Filipino culture those who who provide who provide for the the patient's bill no yung nagfa-finance ng kanyang healthcare siya yung gumagawa ng siya yung gumagawa ng decision making no so we have to also respect that so you have to be careful or always observe the family dynamics whenever you are asking for consent okay tandaan po that your patient's autonomy should be always respected so kapag kayo ay nagpapapirma ng consent and capable naman ang pasyente, huwag na po kayong humingi ng consent sa mga family members. Direktahin nyo na po yung pasyente para hingan ng consent kung nakakapagsulat naman at nakakausap ng maayos. Okay? Now, ito yung sinasabi ko kanina, autonomy should be respected unless his actions constitute an evil act. With that, I end my discussion. Uh, if you have any questions, you can send me a direct message to my messenger. If you want to start a discussion for our uh, in our Facebook group, you may do so. Okay? With that, I end my lecture. Have a nice week.